This is a Founding Media Podcast. Hello, everybody. This is Axel Brave, the host of Packing Taste. I'm glad everyone is tuning in today because we have two wonderful guests, Farah Musalati and Cecilia Panicelli. Farah runs Afia Foods out of Austin, Texas, and Cecilia runs Cocina 54 out of Austin, Texas as well. So we're, we're solely focused today in the capital of our beautiful state. And Farah, what she does, and she'll talk more about it, but essentially it's frozen Mediterranean food, very delicious. And Cecilia does frozen empanadas, which is an Argentine, um, part of the Argentine cuisine, frozen as well. And they'll talk a little bit more about that. But thank you, ladies, for coming in the show today. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for having us. us. Yeah, I've been very excited. I've, <laughs> I've wanted to have you all on for a while because, as I was saying before we started recording, the amount of ethnic food and the diversity of food in Texas is growing so much. And you guys are a great example of that um, with the Mediterranean cuisine and the Argentine cuisine. So thank you for, for sharing the love and the passion of food with us Texans. Yeah. Um, I guess where we can start, I think it'd be awesome for you guys to tell us your story about where you're from exactly. So our listeners can understand where these foods are coming from. And when did you guys move to Austin, Texas? I don't know who wants to take the lead, but okay, you go for it. Okay, I'll go. Hi, everyone. I'm Cecilia Panicelli. Um, I was actually born in Mendoza, wine country of Argentina, but lived all my life in Buenos Aires, Argentina, until I was um, 21 and came to UT to do an exchange program there. Uh, yeah, lo- Longhorns, Lego Longhorns. Uh, <laughs> so I, um, I I came here. I met my husband, who's uh, the co-founder of Cocina 54. And we settled in, in beautiful Austin. Uh, but growing up, we we always ate empanadas. We we loved empanadas. They were part of every baptism, birthday parties. Um, so uh, when we came to the States, we, we found that we couldn't find empanadas uh, that were like good and that we really liked. Um, so we used to make them ourselves. And um and uh, our friends loved them. Uh, everyone was like, please get me some empanadas. I will uh, always take them to the office. And and so that's why we basically started the company two years ago. Nice. That's be- empanadas. I, again, I my parents are from Argentina, so I grew up with the empanadas. But it, you're right. They, they were very difficult to find for a while. And we could only find them in... Like little coffee shops. Yeah, yeah, coffee shops or sometimes restaurants or a food truck here and there. But you, you didn't have that convenience of like going to the grocery store, or doing that trip and like making sure that you can grab some good exactly. empanadas to have them in the freezer ready for a busy weeknight dinner. There you go. And Farah, you, where, where, where do you hail from? Um, so I am originally from Syria, uh, born and bred in England. So lived all my life there in 2012. I married my husband Yassine and moved over with my daughter to Austin, Texas. So traveled continents for, for love, let's, yeah. let's put it that way. <laughs> um, and when I first moved here, I mean, although England and the States, you know, we speak the same language, but things are very different. So for the first few years, um, you know, I just had to adapt and assimilate myself to certain different things. Um, and during that time, I spent a lot of it helping, helping um, you know, uh, struggling refugees because there was a huge influx of them coming into Austin. At the same time, my mother-in-law fled the war in Syria. Um, and along with her, she bought this black recipe book and it's just filled with recipes handed down from generation to generation, like pure authenticity. So lucky for me, she moved in with us and she would cook this amazing food every single night. My kids absolutely loved it. Um, and then um, I would just look around and I just would not see this Mediterranean slash Middle East and, you know, that whole Levante area. I wouldn't see any of this food in the freezer section. And I was like, you know, it's a huge growing, you know, food, Mediterranean food, but it's just not readily available for consumers. So, you know, pairing that up with, um, you know, starting a business, having this asset in my hand, which was this black recipe book filled with mm-hmm. recipes um, and wanting to actually run my own business um, and help refugees. So I put those two together and, you know, we're out there. We, we, we provided Mediterranean food to the consumers. Yeah. And before 
before the empanadas and before the Mediterranean food, when you guys got here and realized, oh, well, some of my favorite foods aren't readily available, what were some of your favorite foods immediately when you got here? Were they the tacos? Was it the barbecue? Um, for me? Do you remember, like, a certain food you had, like, the first year you were the here? The first that, thing, the Mexican food I wasn't too used to because mm-hmm. we just don't have it in England, but it was it was the barbecues. Yeah. It was here. That is just what I <laughs> fell in love with and I loved. Um Obviously, now I've gotten used to the tacos, but it was definitely the barbecue. The barbecue? Oh, yeah. The sauce, too? or just Everything the, about it, yeah. the sauce, the actual meat, everything was just fantastic. I still love it till now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for me, it was the same thing. Uh, actually, I, 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 when I, my first job here, I was at Stubbs Barbecue. I was their marketing manager for six years. Uh, so, like, I love, like, I got, ver- like, very deep and uh, introduced to a uh, good barbecue. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, barbecue was just, like, the thing the the ribs the, the, the everything brisket like the just the smoked brisket is just amazing was it like because we we all eat meat in our in our cultures right but the barbecue was totally different than what we were used to did yeah. that startle you at first or it was like no this is too good I don't, I'm not gonna think about it too much <laughs> um yeah I mean it's different to how we eat meat like we'll usually have it like as a kebab or yeah. you know um, on a on a grill yeah over the fire over the fire Here's over the smoke there yeah. you go so it was it was it was a different taste but it wasn't something that you know I just couldn't adapt to I absolutely loved it my family even came over from England and they're just like you know we want barbecue just take us to barbecue so yeah, yeah. no for, for me it was just like incredible like uh, yes it is completely different to the open flame that you will find in Argentina. The type of barbecue, the asado is, is very different, yeah. but um, truly the, the flavors that you can have, like with a good small brisket. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are so many talented, like people that, that can do that here, that it was amazed to be submerged in that culture. Yeah. And when, um, I guess, growing up or when you were here, cooking, we can consider cooking pretty big in both of our cultures, in the Syrian culture and the Argentine culture. How'd you guys learn how to cook? Who taught you how to make empanadas? Who taught you how to make keba? Was it your mother, your father, your... I like you uh, yeah, so my mom, uh, obviously, like she... Well, not obviously, but uh, my mom, uh, yes, she she was the one that taught us. She absolutely loves cooking and loves every cuisine out there uh she um she just like is one person that will do like spice trainings because she just was very much into spices so uh growing up we we have the fortune that uh, she didn't have to work for 10 years so uh growing up she was in the kitchen a lot till till we went into middle school and then she started having a, a job outside the house too but uh she just loved cooking and i think that was uh an incredible part and then uh, my my grandparents too both of um, both both sides. I have an Italian side and a Spanish side, so I have a lot of different, a very big mix of uh, different cuisines. From my um, my one of my grandmothers making pasta from scratch, and it's like just the best fresh mm-hmm. pasta that you will have ever in your life. And, and, and would she bring? Would she say like, Cecilia, come on, come come help me cook? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there was like no pasta machine or anything. She will just cut the pasta with a knife, and that was it. And uh, she will have like everyone on a Sunday and the Bolognese was just perfect. And I think that uh, that love was incredible on my on my the Spanish, um, my Spanish family. Uh, my my grandfather will wake up at se- six o'clock in the morning and I ask and ask my grandmother, what are we cooking? Go to the um, fruit and veggie market and mm-hmm. grab like the freshest ingredients. They live in the country. So they just grab the freshest ingredients and we will have like lots of different flavors um, um, he might grill some food. Um, my my grandma will just make like a kind of a ratatouille with um, vegetables. Uh, she will make pasta too. So uh, it was incredible. Just both of them will, uh, both of my grandmothers and my mom, they, they were always very much into food and, and taught me like the love of, of for cooking and for bringing like great flavors to the table and and what was like that honor of serving those foods to your family yeah and was that uh, similar with with you right was it mainly the the women in the family that taught you how to cook yeah definitely really definitely be it like on my side be it my mom be it my grandma i mean they Mm -hmm. you know they just they would make everything just like celia they would make everything from scratch um, you know, whether it was in Syria, whether it was in England, um, and just seeing them prepare things from scratch and just 
they put love and time into these meals that they prepare for us. Um, so I would watch them a lot um, and I would see their techniques. And then when obviously my mother-in-law came, the love that she put into her food, like something that I would have cooked in half an hour, she would spend an hour and a half there, you know, putting that extra love into it, putting that extra soul into it. And it was just like, this is amazing. Yeah. It really is. And, and would she also bring you in like, hey, Farah, come help me cook. Come cut this onion. Oh, she, yeah, she'd definitely give me the onions. That's yeah. That was the onion. <laughs> See, I was always stuck with the dishes. That was, <laughs> yeah. And for a while, I was like, oh, yeah. So in my family, my, my mother's an excellent cook as well. But my father and I were the ones who cook a lot. And when I was young, it'd be like, Axel, come on, look, we're going to do an asado or we're going to do a pasta or we're going to do this or that. And I was so excited. I'm like, okay, what do you want me to chop? What do you want me to do? He's like, no, no, what, can you wash that dish over there? I, we just finished. I'd wash it. And then, okay, well, can I, can I stir this? No, no, you need to, you need to wash the cutting board. You, uh, cooking is about keeping everything clean. That's what he would say. It's like, and he always told me a great chef cleans up after themselves. And I would be the one always cleaning after him. <laughs> but no, he, he's, he's the one who I think taught me most of what I know when it comes to cooking. It wasn't really my mother. My mother was like good at five different dishes, mm -hmm. some lentils, some pasta. But um, it definitely, I think we're talking about the same feeling here when we would watch our parents yep. cook. And I'm I, hearing you guys say that and, and you guys have kids, I'm thinking like, how am I going to do that with my kids? <laughs> <laughs> like, should I do what my dad did and just make them do the dishes or should I <laughs> let them cut the onion? <laughs> well, I, I, I like on, I, at home, for example, like I have two kids. So my 11 year old is actually, she loves to bake. She mm -hmm. has watched every baking show. Uh, and uh, and so like, I'll just let her have the kitchen and, and it's just fun to just see her experiment and make mistakes. And I'm like, ah, did you yeah. put like that? And like <laughs> one and a half cup of flour, just half cup of flour. Yeah. That, so, um, uh, but yes, there is a very important part of like, okay, the rule number, they know the rule for, for being able to use the kitchen is that you got to leave it better than what you found it. So yeah. oh, Okay, yeah. so my dad wasn't lying. No. We have to, yeah. we have to yeah. clean no, that. That's the rule number one. She loves to cook and I'm like, go for it. Yeah. But the kitchen needs to be all like better than what you found it. Of course. And your, do your children love to cook as so, well? So I got my four girls. Out of them, two of them do. Okay. Uh, one of them really likes the sweet side of stuff. And the other one actually just likes to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, so they will also experiment. Um, they will experiment with different things. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, like, you know, Syrian food or anything. Um, but yes, they do have to clean up after themselves. Um, they do make mistakes, but it's absolutely great. It's, 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 I just believe leaving them to their own devices and letting them learn, you know, through cooking and learn through their mistakes is just the best thing to yeah, do. Yeah. Without a doubt. Um, okay. So kind of to get into, get into the brand talk now. Um, why? So, so obviously you guys grew up cooking uh your parents taught you how to cook or you got to see it and witness it. it you saw that it brought the family together you guys wanted to bring some of that here but why what did you guys have a, one certain drive that made you want to share your cuisine with the austin community or the texas community was it like we don't i, I guess you already answered this you said they didn't have any Mediterranean food here that like, was readily available, and they didn't have any Argentine empanadas here that were readily available. And was that kind of what jump-started this? Like, oh, I'm going to take advantage of this gap? Or was it, I just want to share this awesome food with everybody because it's like, there's no way people shouldn't know about this. So I think for me, um, it was a mixture of several things. It was, um, it was this amazing food that really needed to be shared. Like whenever there was a gathering or anything, my mother-in-law, a party or get together, my mother-in-law was always asked to make certain dishes. Um, so it was definitely wanting to share this food. Um, it was definitely... Um, the, uh, one of the missions behind Afia Foods, which is to, you know, help support these refugees. And I thought, you know, if I start a business and it's successful, I can bring them in and they'd be, you know, part of this great working environment. So it was a great food. It was a mission. And yes, there was a gap in the market. You know, there wasn't any of this great food readily available for consumers. Um, so, you know, those three together for me were definitely, you know, a push for me to start Afia Foods. 
<laughs> so for for us was um, kind of a couple of different things. One was that uh, we, uh, Federico and I, we wanted to start a company together. Uh, Federico has always been the entrepreneur in the family, and I always been in the CPG industry working for for other companies. And we we decided that we wanted to jump uh, together in, in in a new venture. And so we started thinking, what what can we do together? And and food was obviously was like the number one thing. We knew it was going to be food because of uh, my background. And um, and so we were like, everyone really like is raving about empanadas. And, and so we, we did a lot of research. Uh, we didn't jump into it like right away. Um, we did a lot of research. I am like, a, I love doing research <laughs> <laughs> sometimes too much. Uh, but uh, we looked and we looked at the consumers and uh, because obviously like our friends love them. Everyone was craving for mm -hmm. asking us to make some, but uh, but also we looked at what the consumer was looking and and we looked at the American consumer and we saw that they were looking for better for you products, um, meaning like non-GMOs, meaning fresh ingredients, meaning gluten-free, but they are not willing to sacrifice taste or convenience. Mm -hmm. They were looking for uh, something that will fit their busy lifestyle. So some like grab and go product that they can go and take to the office. And then empanada was just that perfect thing. And then they were also looking for ethnic, authentic foods. And so we were like, well, check, check, check. Like we have a product that is made with fresh vegetables. We, we, we are one of the few uh, empanadas that actually have a lot of fresh vegetables uh, in uh, as a filling. Uh, we also have like it's a gluten free um it's portable. It's already pre-baked. It's not fried. And uh, and also it's authentic. We we grew up with this mm -hmm. culture. Uh, I'm not going to claim empanadas as Argentinians because the whole Latin America is going <laughs> to yeah, yeah. get very upset about that. Uh, I won't argue with you. <laughs> I know you yeah. won't. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we, we basically saw those three things uh, coming alive and we were like, let's, let's make empanadas. <laughs> yeah. And you, I guess... Yeah, the, I, I love I love asking that question because it's never one answer. Oh, I did this because of that. It's like no, it was a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Yep. Um, but the I guess the importance of cooking and the power of sharing food that was that was the way you wanted to help refugees, and that was the way that you wanted to well, you wanted to start a, a business with with Fede, mm -hmm. Federico, and um, cooking or food was the way that was the outlet, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I oh, don't know. I find that interesting. Being in Austin, it's not like, let's make an app together to yeah. save the refugees or something. It was food. It was food. Do you think, do you, th do you think, um, yeah, you can. I'm so sorry. No, no, no. You're <laughs> good. You're good. Um, why do you think food has so much power? Or why do you think yeah. it's, it's a, is it just us that think that or it's just part of our lives yeah like you you, you it's part of our life it's it's our heritage uh it's the flavors it's just like those smells that you walk into like your grandmother's kitchen and you just smell that and you it just transports you and so i i think just like music has an effect on how you feel and, and makes you feel good uh food has that same effect yeah yeah, I think um, uh, just food is is our universal common ground, no matter where you're from. You know, what you look like, who you believe in, what you believe in is food brings everybody together, you know. Um, so I just think food has so much strength in bringing cultures and people together and, you know, bringing joy and love to the table. So I do believe in its, in its importance, yeah. Yeah, it was actually funny because a couple of uh, months ago, we had dinner with our families together, Farhan and, and our family. And so we brought some Argentinian desserts and, and she fed uh, her Mediterranean food to my kids. And my kids weren't like crazy really? about her food <laughs> and her kids weren't crazy about the yeah. desserts. And so it's what did just you guys make? funny. At the time, obviously, I made there was kibbeh on the menu, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> on the menu. and we made um, at the time there was was there stuffed vine leaves, the mm. like the dolmas. I don't remember, but the hummus the, was incredible. Like and everything was. We incredible. made like a a kibbeh, a kibbe yeah. and a salad, a, yeah, like a fetus salad. But the kibbeh is my kids rice like, yeah. like I had to keep going to H E B and grabbing some bags because they love it. And yeah. and we make uh, for dessert we make this um, caramel coconut. Uh, Oh, but my kids are still craving. Yeah. <laughs> Next time you guys need to bring some of that here, so, <laughs> so I can try some of it. Um, why do you think? 
obviously with these, the foods you guys are making, why do you think people are so willing to try new foods? Usually I I always had an impression that people or consumers were like, I'm just going to eat what I know because that's what I know. But it seems that there's a lot of consumers, especially today that are willing to try these new foods. Why, Why do you think that's the case? I think they, um, I think they're wanting to taste new foods. Um, I think they are, you know, there's only so much of a routine type of food that you can eat. And then they're wanting that variety. So ethnic food brings in that variety. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that, you know, obviously our foods are kind of, they're, they're clean, you know, they're, they're all natural. And so that's a bonus for the consumer. But, um, I just think, you know, Austin is, there's a lot of cultures, it's very diverse, and people are wanting to try all these different foods. Um, that, that, that's how I see it. Yeah, really. I think that we have, we have a new consumer that has, like, it has evolved a lot. Uh, Pepsi and, and, and Coke, they used to have, like, one, two, like, regular Pepsi, Diet Pepsi, yeah. and now they have to have opened their portfolio to so many different flavors and and, and textures and, and ways to deliver what the consumer is looking for. And it's the same for foods all mm-hmm. around. The consumer is, is it's willing to explore. It's, it's uh, really looking for something different. Um, and, uh, and they get it from the restaurant but then the, when they are at home sometimes they they feel like either because of time or or, or because they just don't know how to make making kipets yeah. or an empanada it's it's not an easy thing i yeah. it, it has uh it, it's complicated to to make so um i think that it has its challenges so i think that um consumers just love having those those flavors available now yeah because the foods you guys make would if you'd make them traditionally at home it would take a couple hours mm-hmm. to make yeah. to yeah. feed your family which is 12 people 15 people mm-hmm. that are coming over mm-hmm. but now with the products you guys make you throw it in the microwave or in the mm-hmm. oven and you can take it eat it in the car yeah yeah Absolutely. super easy convenient. very easy yeah so it, it's like yeah people are willing to try new foods but they have a lot of restrictions like they ne- it needs to be gluten-free mm-hmm. and it needs to be ready in five minutes yes <laughs> and you guys are meeting those yeah. criteria it's a challenge, it's a yeah. challenge. <laughs> what do you think um and we'll get into this super branding part here in a second. But what do you think about the fact that um, so you're sorry. super busy this morning? I am very sorry. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Um, told me. What um? How do you guys feel about you know having learned how to cook this stuff traditionally, doing it for an hour, two hours with the family, to now making a product that is ready in five minutes? Is there some conflict there? You're like, no, this is this is the right translation that I wanted to do for the American consumer or for the Texas consumer. Yeah, I can, I can speak a little bit. So, uh, the story of my grandmother, my grandfather will wake up early, go to the market. That's not my story. Like, mm-hmm. that's not my life. Like, I went to school and I worked, uh, I, I started working in, in different companies and I will work nine to five or even more hours. Uh, I had my daughters. So the, the routine, there is no time to spend that time during the week. Like, we actually during the weekend, we do take time to to cook and, and share those flavors, but during the week it, it's very challenging. So uh, I I go to the freezer aisle and, and grab that like frozen rice or the kipes or the empanadas because they allow me to do other things with my kids that now I can't. So we do have an awesome breakfast on Sundays. Uh, we we do have like made from scratch pizza maybe on Saturday, but uh, during the week it is challenging. I need to have like an empanada. Like la- yesterday was like empanadas going onto the lunch boxes, and that and it's like the empanadas that I just take from the freezer aisle. So yeah. uh, I think we we need to resource to like some good food that it's made from scratch still, but it's just frozen, ready, available yeah. for us. Yeah, I I double down on that. <laughs> I mean, I just think the majority of the people that I know, we we all live you know busy lifestyles. Everything has become fast paced. So yeah. you know, me having four kids, and you know, you having two. So. You need that convenience food in the freezer, but obviously good convenience food for when you're in a hurry or for when you don't have time, um, you know, yeah. working and, and the kids coming back from school. I mean, my kids at this point, they, I always have food in the freezer ready for them. They just open the freezer if I've not 
had the chance to prepare anything or my mother-in-law hasn't. And they all just go and heat it up. And I just think that that has become kind of like a staple throughout a lot of the households I know. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I think it's great to have healthy options and especially even better to have delicious options. Yeah. Yeah. I think that like food that you can trust is what you're looking for and like products that don't have fillers. And, and obviously we looked, we looked, make sure that that's what we have available for, for our families. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> the, like I said earlier, one of the reasons I wanted to have y'all on is because you guys have these ethnic brands translating it to, for the, Texas consumer, American consumer. My main question for you guys is what are some strategies or what do you think is the best way to educate the consumer and say, hey, this isn't barbecue. These aren't tacos. These are empanadas mm -hmm. from South America uh, or, you know, um, these are these are some keba or this is keba from uh from the Mediterranean region, how do you educate the consumer? How do you, because I think we all have the same barrier here with our brands is we, this is from our home country. This is what I've made all my life, but this hasn't been here. Or if it has, it hasn't been super present. How do you guys get over that barrier? I think for me, I'm going to bring it back to how I started. Um, my, my biggest and my biggest help in educating the consumer was actually starting out really small. So I started out in the Texas farmers markets. Um, and for me, that was fantastic. Um, it actually gave me insight as to how to educate my consumer. You know, what is it that I was telling them initially that really didn't work and then what did work? So, you know, when I first started out, it was like, this is good bit. And I wouldn't really explain it. And they were like, well, what is that? Okay, well, it's like, and I would explain the ingredients. It's, you know, a crunchy shell, stuffed a beet. And they were like, oh, well, it's like a stuffed meatball. So my consumers were actually <coughs> telling me, you know, oh, so it's like a stuffed meatball. Oh, so it's like a hush puppy or a stuffed dumpling. So I learned a lot from my consumers starting out at Texas Farmer's Market, um, which is a great place I would, you know, for a small company that's trying to educate consumers, that was great for me. And then obviously the small wheat spills and, and, and farmhouse deliveries, they were a great start. And um, just getting the product in somebody's mouth and explaining it to them, um, that that was, you know, that was what we had to do. Falafel wasn't too much of an issue for us because it is very mainstream. A lot of people yeah. know falafel. Um, but the kibbe, there was a lot of education there. And the consumers actually taught me how to educate them. They 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 told me it's like a stuffed meatball. So, yeah. so you didn't rename your pa your product <laughs> on there. Well. I have it now. Yeah. I have it as a beef croquette on my packaging, yes. just because you know if somebody was to read kibbe, they would need to know kind of what it is. And what a lot of people were saying was a beef croquette or a stuffed meatball. So, do you think do you think naming uh, the name of the product was super important? Um, like you said, kibbe. I, but I think the first time we met. You were telling me exactly this. Mm -hmm. the, well, we learned to include the word jalapeno in one of our uh, products because pe people in Texas really know jalapeno. Yeah. Right. So one of, and it's funny. What I think my favorite product that you make is the the jalapeno the one. The Texan style. Yeah, 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 the Texas style. And whatever, when, whenever a Texan sees the word Texas, it's like, oh, I know what that is. Yeah. Do you think that helped? Um, for my kibbe, um, I mean, I, I did learn that Texans absolutely love spice. So um, we took our traditional kibbe and our authentic one, and we actually provided the Texans with what they wanted, a spicy one. So having Texan style and jalapeno in there, it, it did. I mean, they loved it. It made a difference. It was an ingredient in there that they knew, that they loved. Um, so for that one, there wasn't too much of an education as much as the original kibbe. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely, they the jalapeno one is, is a huge hit here. Yeah. yeah. And do you think do you think when you talk to people about it and does it help to pair it with other foods that American consumers know? Like, oh, try the empanada with a sauce people make here. Like, does that? Yeah, for us, uh, we we did uh, we launched at HEB, um, so uh, we 
the, we do a lot of demos, in-store demos are what we know that 60% of consumers know what an empanada is and 40% still don't know what an empanada is. They might see it and they are like, oh, it's a meat pie or it's a turnover. Mm-hmm. So, um, <laughs> so we are educating them. Uh, we are just telling them what, what it is. Um, but we also did what Farah said, like um, we brought the product. We have our traditional beef that is actually our bestseller, but then we also brought, uh, uh, we added one with jalapenos. And so we use fresh jalapenos in there and it just tastes incredible and it's spicy and it's doing amazing here in Texas because that's what the consumer <laughs> wants here. And so uh, you have to bring your food, you have to bring your culture, uh, but also you have to be sensitive of what the consumer is looking here and what yep. do they, they appreciate. And so the same with uh, salsas or, or dips, like we in Argentina, that's not a big thing. We do have chimichurri, but we don't use that for empanadas. Here, everyone needs to dip, like yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. chips, I, I empanadas. Yeah. And so like, that's that's great. Like that's what consumers are doing here. They're like, oh, I use it with like, uh, I put it in my air fryer and then I use it with queso and I use it with this creamy avocado dip or I use it with a chimichurri sauce. So, and it, it's fine. Like we yeah. want to bring it closer to you. We don't want to impose like, oh, this is the food that we have and you have to be like straight about that. Yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, exactly. Like, and because you, you want to stay true and authentic to, yeah. to what you're doing, but you don't want to exclude people. So you you allow them to dip their empanada in the chimichurri and you allow them to put oh, the hot sauce in the... I'm <laughs> in case they might be Yeah, them. yeah. And that's funny you bring that up because I've been transformed into eating my empanadas with chimichurri. I know. And it with the, tastes amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> and with the, the kibba, I was putting uh, Siete's habanero hot sauce all over it and just like... Oh, nice. <laughs> it was so good. It was, it was, and that's what, I, that's what I had for breakfast a couple days, a d- days ago it was... It was definitely good, but it's, I think it's easier for consumers to understand what your product is when they mix it with something they already know, yep. right? Does that, do you see a lot of that? I mean, um, for me, yes. A lot of my consumers, they will mix it. They will dip it into mm-hmm. a ranch. Um, a lot of them actually, they dip it in, you know, hummus, which actually goes great with our product. So because hummus is a dip is like very mainstream and everybody knows it they will use that as an option but a lot of them they just like it with their ranch and they like it with their yeah. cheesy sauce and and it's yeah. funny if if you take that back home to Syria or to Argentina the Argentines and the Syrians would be like what are you doing yeah. what, 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 stop playing with your food Yeah, right? no, like, I think it is a little bit like Mexican food and Tex-Mex food and like exactly. even if, yeah. but if you go to Argentina you are going to have sushi in Argentina it's going to be different than the sushi from uh, Japan so it, yeah. it's just different like we we adapt the food and, and, and we make like changes that we think that um, are, are going to be good for the consumer yeah and what um, do you, you guys do a lot of social media? Does that also help? Is that a good way to show people um, recipes and how to like prepare your food and pair it with other foods? We are a small, very, very, very small company. <laughs> it's just two people and a couple of part timers. Yeah. So uh, we we do it all ourselves. So I think social media it's a great way to communicate, uh, but um, but it's also an ex- a very expensive thing. So um, right now we we do have a lot of demos. Uh, we have a lot of word of mouth, uh, just consumers loving the product and telling friends and sharing that. And to us, that's the most powerful brand ambassador that we will ever have. Um, and so social media, yes, but like there is a lot of information there. So from there going all the way to the consumer and that consumer remembering the product that they just saw on Facebook and then going to the supermarket and finding that supermarket in the freezer aisle. Um, it, it's it's a big leap. There's a thing. lot of steps in between <laughs> yeah. you yes. that you just said. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Do you think... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, I do believe social media is important, mm-hmm. um, but there are lots of challenges and it is very difficult. But double down on what Cecilia said, it's the consumer, it's the word of mouth that, yeah. that is. You and know. do you think, do you think uh, specifically with ethnic food brands, the best way to convince the consumer to buy it or try it is word of mouth being in front of them? 
Do you think that's more powerful than social media or a email blast? Oh, definitely. Dem- yes. yeah. Demos, getting it in their mouth. The like, really? Yeah, they they really don't care how they, do you call them. It's an empanada, or, and they th- thought they was a meat pie, but yeah. they taste it, and they are like, wow, mm. like how is this possible? Like, and they are like, I mean, the frozen aisle, like, it, and this tastes so fresh. And we're like, well, we use like raw spinach when we make our empanadas, so you're gonna taste that. You, yeah. We use like like fresh onions, French jalapenos, and so you you can taste those flavors. And the minute someone tastes it, they really don't care how they call, yeah. you call them. You're do, just educating them there. Do you think Do you think it's a trust thing? It's if somebody's never tried this before and they're going to try it for the first time, they rather have a real life person talk to them about it versus a 30 second ad on Facebook. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. More yeah. trusting. We are still people and <laughs> yeah, yeah. and the smells like you're cooking in this supermarket and they just smell that and then they just come by and they try it and uh, yes. They, yeah. I, I don't know why I always act surprised when people tell me that. It's like <laughs> demos being in front of the customer. I'm like, yeah, duh, don't forget. <laughs> I, I, I guess like as entrepreneurs, we get lost in testing all the channels. People are telling us, you got to be on Instagram. You got to be on YouTube. You got to be doing this. You got to go to this show. It's like, well, I think I think I'm just going to stand in front of the customer and talk to them. Yeah. That's the best way. To that, that's it. what's been the best for us, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And yeah. it's it's a lot of work. Like you have like weekends, like Saturdays and Sundays, Ooh. we we cross yeah. each other at the supermarket. Yeah. Uh, but but it is it is what yeah. really the consumer um, sees you there and they find your product right there. So it, it's it's what it gets them. That's awesome. That's awesome. We're talking about this. I'm writing an article exactly about um, on the field hustle. So I'm going to quote all this. So thank you. (laughs) You guys are writing my article for me. Um, Okay. And obviously being in the great state of Texas, what have, what have been some awesome support systems that you guys have seen here that have helped your brand um, get in front of consumers or support systems that have helped your brand, um, tell its story to the consumers so they can relate to it. Yeah. Um, in, in Austin, like you have like amazing places like SKU, for example, that it's like a business accelerator here. And we were part of their track number five and it really helped us um, like accelerate our business yeah. and get, be ready when we launch at HEB. Um, so I think that's like the number one thing. Austin has so like, it, it's just like a, a hotbed for like CBG brands. It's mm-hmm. amazing. Like how, how many CBG brands are here? Too many. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's amazing. It's incredible because you, you do have all the support uh, uh, from other entrepreneurs. And so that's, that's also, that's also part of the journey. And just being able to share that. And uh, if not, it's a lonely journey if you don't have people yeah. around yeah. you. And so yeah. I think that what we have found is that uh, being in Austin, it, it's incredible because of that. Because you have, uh, you have uh, like, at least what I, I always lived here in Austin. So I don't know how it is in, in like in different parts of the country. But what we always hear is like everyone in Austin is so open to share. It's so open to just like give back. And um, at, at least that has been my experience with like, like um, mentors and and, pe- and other entrepreneurs that are just there. And we are setting up with like products uh, for one retailer and we're just sharing, oh, how are you doing this? Because if, if not, it, it gets lonely. Yeah, it <laughs> does. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that the, you know, the, the greatest support here in Austin is the people, you know. And I would say it throughout the whole of Texas as well. I mean, everybody just... You know, they're, they're a shoulder for you to lean on. Um, great support system. They want local to succeed. Um, so I, I just think all the other entrepreneurs out there and CPGs, you know, you have a question, you pick up the phone, you can ask anybody and anybody's going to give you the answer that you need. And one more thing, I think uh, HEB Quest for Texas Best has like a big part of that because it gives us brands like an amazing opportunity to be showcase and to be part of this uh, this experience. We did it two years ago. We were one of the finalists and it's incredible to, to have like a retailer like HEB that is just there to help you and to support you. And I think 
that has made a tremendous difference for the brands in Texas, uh, that they have uh, ATV, that it's there and like you can participate on their uh, contest. You can become a finalist. You get a chance to sit down with the buyers and bring your product to life and partner with them. Um, so I think that's 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 very incredible yeah. that they are bringing that flavor diversity into their stores and supporting local brands. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. I Because uh, it's very, I haven't heard a story yet that says, no, so-and-so didn't want to help me. Or these people were being mean and they didn't. Everyone that's been on this show, everyone who I've talked to in the last three years since I've started my own brand, everyone has been super helpful here. Yeah. I haven't heard a single story of like, no, nobody wanted to help me talk, introduce me to this buyer. Um, and I think that's why we're becoming such a powerhouse in the CPG. It's because everyone is helping one another. It's like, oh, they need some help. Oh, they need some help. I, um, I'm staying with a friend of mine who was kind of complaining. He's like, man, I go to every bar now. And he, he's a Topo Chico fanatic. He has 18 <laughs> cases. He's like, I go to every bar now and there's no more Topo Chico. Every, there's only Richard's Rainwater who has been on the, he was our first episode. And I'm like, yeah, man, that's because here in Austin, you guys just support local so much, which is great. I mean, that's how all these brands have been exploding. Um, I, I think it's fascinating. And I think, so So if you guys don't know, um, Farah and Cecilia are, I think I can say this, you guys are in the Chobani Incubator. Yes. Way, no secret. <laughs> yeah. um, they're, they're in the Chobani Incubator. And I think we've talked about them quite a few times, but they... That's just a clear sign to me how helpful all the food community throughout the states is. Like, there's so much more interest and so much more care in what we're eating that people are becoming more helpful within the industry. Um, just just to showcase better products and get more ethnic foods in front of other consumers. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, um, you know, obviously for. Uh, Again, HEB was a great start for us, you know, being part of the Quest for Texas and, you know, becoming on HEB shelves was amazing. But it was that step that a local company, you know, like HEB took us on that kind of like gave us the credibility to be able to apply for the Chobani Incubator and then see, you know, well, yeah, they're in HEB. So I would say, you know, the local, you know, support here that we got were able to help us branch out into other states. Um, and with the Chobani Incubator, they are looking for better food. They're looking for these smaller emerging brands that, you know, do struggle at the beginning to help them, give them that push because it is great products. It is good food. Um, and, you know, we, we do sometimes, you know, till now need that push as a small brand. We need that, that, that help. And these bigger companies like Chobani are readily, you know, helping us and providing us with, with that push. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, did you want to? Yeah, no, the, the Choban Incubator has been incredible. Yeah. And I think that they have, um, if, if you go to their offices, you can see diversity alive. And within I, the brands? Within the brands, but within the people within as well. Company, like yeah. within, yeah, their culture. And I think that that's what they want to do with their incubator to not bring me to things, um, but bring flavors that are different, people that are different. And and it's been an incredible experience. Um, but I think that's like, you see that they, they don't talk about millennials. They are millennials. They, yeah. they like, they don't talk about <laughs> Uh, moms, they are moms, yeah. and so uh, when you see that, when 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 you see that diversity um, in in the people that work there, uh, the way they think, what they believe in, I think that that's uh, incredible. And with the incubator, that's that's what they try to do. Like we, it's funny because like the flavors and the food that we have there, like in this uh, in this cohort, it's in, it's completely like we are not like everyone is different. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what um. I guess we, we have to wrap up soon, but what are some key advice or key uh, tips that you would like to share with entrepreneurs who want to introduce a foreign food product to Texas? Cause I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what I said because I had a phone call with someone who wants to start a hummus company yesterday. Mm. And I was like, I'm going to talk about all this tomorrow. But what, what are some... What's some key advice that you could offer to entrepreneurs who want to sh bring their culture here through food? Um, 
I'm drawing from personal experience. Of the, yes, please. Is, um, is be out in front of the people at the farmer's market. That really, really helped us because you've got so many people there and um, the people at the farmer's market, when they're walking by, they've got time to sit down and, you know, or just stand and listen and understand this product and, you know, what it's about and the story behind it. And that one person then goes on and tells their friend and their family and it kind of like extrapolates from there. So for me, it would be starting, you know, in a local place where you can be in front of so many people. Um, and then as you grow, it's... The next step for us was the, the the quest for Texas. You know, that was just huge. But we'd grown and we'd got some consumer feedback by the time we applied for that. Sweet. Um, quest for Texas. Yeah, you guys, if you're listening, look that up. That's that's very, a very powerful. It's not a program. It's a competition. It right? is, yes, yeah. it is a competition. Um, where, do, where do y'all see the ethnic packaged food sector going? Do you think it's rising? Uh, it's obviously rising, but yeah. how how fa- how big do you think it's going to get? I think that it has been, it has reached several different aisles in the supermarket. Obviously, it has reached like out of home, like food, like everything, like uh, has to do with food trucks and restaurants. It's there already. Like we, you see the diversity that it's out there when you go to different restaurants. It's not barbecue yeah. <laughs> like it used to be before or Tex-Mex yeah. here in Texas. There, there used to be one international aisle at HEB. Now, like you said, y- y'all's food isn't even in the no, international No, yeah. no. So I think that it's uh, w- what is happening is it's that is there is not going to be the international section mm-hmm. uh, in the supermarket, but that has permeated uh, because it's, it's in the end, there are different flavors and that's what the consumer is looking for. And so they go to the uh, spice section and they can find like different spices from uh, all over the world. Uh, And I think that there are certain uh, aisles like the frozen aisle. I think that's it's hitting now that that innovation. It happened like with like bars, for example, like you can see all sort of bars like snacks. You can see all sort of snacks. And I think it's finally arriving to the frozen aisle where like it's innovating and it was ripe for innovation that 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 section of the freezer aisle. It was (laughs) looking we had the burritos for a long time and now consumers are needed yeah the consumers are looking for different snacks different flavors because they they have found those it's like sriracha they tasted that at the at the restaurant now they want to be able to buy it at the supermarket it's it's in all the all the tables sriracha um Okay, I think the last question I have for y'all is, um, what's one, th- <laughs> I always laugh at this question, but what's one thing you wish you knew when you started all this? Oh, gosh. Oh. So much, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like, it down Pull to out your thing. notebook. <laughs> um, okay. It needs a lot of patience, let's put it that way. Um, you, you, if you're going into the food industry, CPG, um, it's a great journey. It's a great ride, but there's a lot of patience that comes along with it. A lot of perseverance. You need a lot of determinations because, um, you know, there's quite a lot of no's along the way before you get that first yes. And if you give up after the 10th no or 15th no, you could have been one, you know, one no away from a yes. So just be patient. It's it's tough, but it's an incredible journey. It really is. Yeah, I think for for me is uh, learning that you have to live with imperfect things. And I think that like coming from like big corporations uh, that I used to work with and even like other like bigger companies, like when you start your own company, it's like if you can get it done, then that that's good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and sometimes being OK with not having the perfect thing out there, uh, you, you have to be able to live with that. And I think that sometimes it's hard. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, that it's it's one in, uh, at the personal level I would say surround yourself with like brilliant intelligent people there are amazing mentors out there uh, we we have an incredible community of, of CPG, CPG people that I think that are um, great to tap in and so and they they are available so that would yeah be. so so be patient and don't seek perfection be okay <laughs> yeah, with, seek, be okay with just doing things <laughs> yeah um beautiful that very well said um so where to wrap up wh- where can people find your stuff now 
Um, H-E-B. H-E-B. Um, you can find our stuff at H-E-B. We sell at the smaller co-ops as well, like Wheatsville, Farmhouse Delivery mm-hmm. Online. Um, but H-E-B currently, um, we're in just over 200, oh, 200 stores around mm-hmm. Texas. So here in Austin, San Antonio and Houston. Which section of H-E-B? Uh, yep, the frozen <laughs> healthy food aisle in H-E-B. Good. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so our empanadas are available at H-E-B um, too. Uh, they are also available at Amazon um, outside of Texas. Uh, so they can find them in the quick meal aisle in, in the frozen section. Uh, we are coming up now with like a single serve bag. We used to have like the box and now it's coming single serve. So you'll be able to take them everywhere. So thank you for having us. Yes. <laughs> Anything else? Any other like news you guys want to share? Any name? I don't know. Well, I know. Just thank you for having us, and um, the, thank you for listening, and uh, thank you everybody in Texas, yeah, honestly, for the great support. Yeah, I um, pleasure is all mine. I loved. Obviously, we're doing this for all the listeners, but I always I, I feel like I take more information than anybody else. <laughs> so I, I I loved having you guys on again, uh, Farah from Afia Foods, who you can find. Um, at HEB in the frozen section aisle, and Cecilia from Cocina 54, who is also in the frozen healthy aisle at HEB. The so snack aisle. Snack yeah. aisle, Yeah, yes. the quick meals. It's called quick meals, actually, at HEB. Well, there you go. So <laughs> you guys go purchase some of this stuff, try it out, go to their websites, follow them on Instagram. They have wonderful recipes, and keep on enjoying the tasty, tasty ethnic food that us Texans are providing. Yeah. Thank you guys for listening. 